In the fall of 1963, I was I just turned seven years of age and was in the second grade at Holy Trinity Catholic School in Poughkeepsie, New York. As I recall, I sat in a seat one row away from the windows. The windows overlooked the parking lot, which during recess was the playground. And one day, one afternoon in November, I remember my teacher seeming to just disappear from the classroom with no explanation. And she was gone for a long time. No, nobody knew why. We just sat there and I then remember seeing her and some other teachers standing in the doorway of the classroom. The door was open and some of them were in the hallway and some were kind of leaning against the door frame of the, uh, of, of the classroom and some of the teachers were crying. That's my memory of November 22nd, 1963. What more does a seven-year-old remember? I have other memories in the days that followed, some that are fleeting, others that are more vivid. And probably the most vivid one was the sound of the drummers as they marched to Arlington Cemetery. The sound of the drums just incessantly going over the same staccato tune. Dun, 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 over and over again, incessantly, repeatedly. And continuing, unending for 20 or 30 minutes, whatever it was, until they got to the grave site in Arlington, where upon arrival, the sound ceased. And the absence of sound was every bit as profound as the sound itself, even to a seven-year-old. My next encounter with the JFK assassination story occurred about five years later. I was about 12 years of age. And uh, I was babysitting the neighbor's kids, two little boys. And in the five, six hours they were got, uh, I was there, I uh, read through a copy of the uh, Warren report that they had on their bookshelf. And in that time, I probably read a hundred or so pages, skipping here and there. And uh, that kind of whet my appetite. Um, and in the years that followed that, I heard a story here, a story there, mostly on the conspiracy side of things. And obviously, by then, there was some growing concern about the official story, the official report. And then this kind of all came to a head, of course, when we finally got to see the Zapruder film. And it's hard to explain to people today who have maybe seen it a hundred times and it's just part of the fabric of their, of their life, but when that film was first shown, it shocked people. Not just because of the brutality visible on the film, but because it that really contradicted what we believed the official story was. That the shot came from the rear. And remember, we had Dan Rather and other reporters indicate that having viewed the film, they recognized, they saw, excuse me, saw the president's head move forward directly contradicted by the video or the film showing just the opposite. And not only did it show, you know, the very brutal scene, the cloud of blood and whatnot, but you see the president's head move backwards and, you know, backwards and to the, to the left. When you correlate that with the official story, it seemed to be contradictory. 
But when you correlated it with one of the other most common stories, that being a shot from the grassy knoll, it visually made perfect sense. So the immediate aftermath of the release of that film to the public was so significant that ultimately it led to the House Select Committee uh, review of the assassination. And that's a whole other game thing in its own right. Suffice it to say that my personal opinion after viewing the Subruder film was that there was, in fact, a conspiracy. And that whether or not Oswald had anything to do with it, uh, if a shot came from the front, the grassy knoll or any other place from the front, that ruled out Oswald as having committed, uh, performed that shot, whether or not he shot any other um, shots, was, is irrelevant. If a shot came from the front, Oswald couldn't have done it, therefore there had to have been a conspiracy. There's just mathematically, logically, there's no other way around it. So, from that point on, I was a committed uh, believer in the conspiracy. And I don't think I was unreasonable for having that view. My next encounter with the story was in the mid-80s, um, at the time I was on the um, sort of the early version of the consumer internet. Internet had been around since the early 70s at the university level, but for consumers, the, uh, the first kind of real global network was things like CompuServe, and I was on CompuServe. And I remember uh, one of the groups there uh, uh, talked about the JFK assassination, which pro probably where I discovered or learned about the um, the jet effect, as described by um, physicist Louis Alvarez, who, um, by any stretch, is about as smart a person as we've ever seen. Manhattan Project physicist, uh, co-discoverer of the asteroid theory that uh, destroyed the um, the dinosaurs. Smart guy, right? So, at the time I was studying physics myself and, and did a little review of the um, of, of the event at a, you know, on a, on a basis of energy. And, you know, I had to concede that there is sufficient energy in the kinetic energy in the bullet that if sufficiently converted into a jet would produce a reaction force sufficient to move the head as seen in the Zapruder film. Uh, I don't have the numbers at, at, in front of me, but as I recall, going back almost 30 years, the um, if as little as about 30% of the energy of the bullet, kinetic energy of the bullet, was converted into a sufficiently um, coherent stream of uh, ejected material, you could produce a, uh, a reaction force from that jet sufficient to move the head as you've seen it. I would say, however, that the visual uh, uh, interpretation of the Zapruder film doesn't suggest to me that there was, was sufficient mass or velocity of the ejected material to produce the effect sufficient to produce the reaction. So while the report by Alvarez is almost certainly accurate on a uh, possibility standpoint, that is, the energy of the bullet is sufficient if converted sufficiently to a jet to produce that effect. Uh, where I have some problems, however, is in believing that a sufficient quantity of mass, blood, bone, brain, whatever, was ejected at sufficient velocity pr to produce that effect. So that brings me to my next encounter. I don't recall, I suspect, suspect it would have been the JFK film by, uh, um, um, with Costner in it. But the next sort of more personal 
encounter was in 1993. I was uh, had traveled from my home in upstate New York to Florida. I had family down there and stayed there for a, a couple of weeks in vacation. And on my way back to New York, I took a rather extended detour west towards Dallas for the 30th anniversary of the assassination. <clears throat> so I was there for the 30th anniversary of the assassination, and while there, I recorded about 1.7 hours of video. Um, video of the area, you know, from the various locations. Uh, we also had witnesses um, that were there that um, were available for people to ask questions, interviews. And then there was a, a segment on speeches uh, where various people kind of formally spoke for a few minutes. Uh, so what I did with that video is just basically stored away for a long time. And uh, just recently, uh, I, in another news group that I follow with some frequency, uh, the story was kind of kicked back up again. And I mentioned I had the video, and then I realized, you know, I probably ought to do something with it. Um, I don't anticipate there's anything in the video that would be of any, you know, revelation. But for the sake of putting it out there and, and you know, letting people see for themselves, uh, I took that 1.7 hours of video and edited it so that I organized all of the interview sections into one video, all of the speeches section into another video, and a third video on the setting, the scene, the the location. The first of the three videos to follow is the setting video, which uh, details the location, video taken from various locations in Dealey Plaza, locations, for example, where various witnesses were, excuse me, at the time of the um, uh, assassination. And from those locations, I would pan up to the uh, school book depository, or over to the uh, grassy knoll, so you had a sense as to what their perspective of the scene was from that location. Um, another thing that I've done did it in that video, and something I don't think I've seen in any of the videos um, of, the, of the area, was along the uh, stockade fence uh, behind the grassy knoll. Well, what I did was I started at the very far end, which would be, I guess, the, the west end of the um, fence, and followed along the entire length of it with the camera looking basically towards the direction of where the motorcade was coming from. So you could see what the perspective of anybody at that location would see as you moved along. So you could see various perspectives along the fence, all the way up until you got to where the fence ended and then turned left near where the wall is. Uh, again, pretty much the location of where people think the, um, the grassy knoll shooter would have been, the badge man would have been. So. That video shows the entire stretch of the stockade fence. So you get a sense, obviously we're talking 1993, so 30 years after the event, the foliage would not be the same, so it wouldn't be exactly as it looked in 1963, but you do get a sense as to your perspective on the motorcade in particular. The interview video, which uh, follows, includes interviews, uh, some of which are personal questions I asked, but also questions that others that were around were asking, of basically three witnesses. Uh, Be Beverly Oliver, who's known as the Bubushka Lady, Dr. Robert Livingston, and Charles Brem. The video isn't professionally done, obviously. I mean, wasn't a professional, and with dozens of other people around, you know, kind of jockeying for position. Uh, it certainly wasn't like the, a studio setting you would see most politicians or interview subjects being interviewed with. 
But um, I did get the chance to ask questions of um, two of these three. I didn't. I don't think I asked any questions to Charles Charles Brem. But um, Beverly Oliver and Dr. Livingston in particular, uh, I, I did ask some questions, and there was others who asked questions as well. Of those, uh, the doctor's uh, answers and, and his observations were, I think, the most relevant. Uh, again, I don't think there was a whole lot here that people haven't heard from before, so I'm not anticipating any revelations coming out of it, but again, um, I did record the video, and I don't see any particular reason why I should hold on to it. So I'll throw it up there on the odd chance that there's some nugget that will be of some value. The third video that follows is the uh, what I refer to as the speeches video, and that involved um, five different speakers over some 35 minutes thereabouts. Uh, the speakers were uh, Malcolm Summers, who is now dead, Aubrey Lee Reich, who was the ambulance driver, and he's now dead, Jim Mars, um, there was another, uh, the fourth guy was a member of the House uh, Select Committee on Assassinations, and I do not have his name, um, he didn't mention it in the video as I have it recorded, so if anybody knows who that person is, Please comment with his name so I can, you know, correct that. And the the last speaker uh, is Robert Broden, um, uh, who was also a member of the House Select Committee on uh, assassin, Assassinations, um, and had been obviously a fairly well known, uh, outspoken critic of the official story, and has voiced his own opinions about the assassination. So that covers the, uh, the three videos, um, and, and finally, really, I wanted to talk about the technology of recording the event. Back in 1963, didn't have video cameras, didn't have high-def cameras, didn't have 4K cameras. They had 8mm film, and um, film cameras, still cameras of generally low quality, most individuals didn't have 35 millimeter cameras back then. Um, they were, you know, 120s or whatever it was, basically a lot smaller film. So quality of the, of the film, quality of the uh, um, 8 millimeter film in particular is not too good. Now, I was there in 1993, and the technology at that time was advanced, but, you know, Certainly, again, not digital cameras, not um, high eight. I mean, actually, not uh, uh, high definition or 4K video. What I had at the time was considered a, a high, higher end consumer grade camera, uh, the Sony High Eight, um, which was superior to VHS and ballparkish around about what a Betamax was, ballpark. So the quality of the video, these three videos that you're, you're about to see, is not great. Limits of the technology of the time. But the interesting thing to note is, as I looked at the video, and of course I've had this video for a long time, and I've just recently kind of started looking at it again, and as I did, and kind of compared that to, for example, the Zapruder film and the uh, Nix film and whatnot, the, compar the, the quality of the, of the imagery is fairly comparable. That is to say, the video from the Hi8 camera is in the same ballpark in quality as the uh, 8mm film cameras used in 1963. So, in an odd sort of way, um, even though the quality of the video isn't great, it is at the very least comparable to what was in use at the time. But it kind of raises another question. What if instead of 8mm film cameras, they had something like Hi8 camcorders in 1963? Even though the imagery wouldn't have been any 
substantial amount superior, the addition of that single factor of audio would have been huge. Can you imagine if a half dozen or more, perhaps hundreds of people, had camcorders with audio? The data from the audio alone would nail this case. Would nail it. A single camera with the stereo microphones would give you a gross indication of the direction of the sound and knowing which direction the camera was pointing because you're able to see the video and knowing the location the, the camera was at you could grossly determine you know right or left was it coming from the school book depository or the grassy knoll based on amplitude time of arrival differences between the stereo channels you would have some sense probably not very precise, but at least a ballpark sense as to where things came from. But when you combine that data from with the other cameras scattered throughout the plaza, I'm confident that if you had a few dozen camcorders recording throughout the plaza and were able to sync up the video and therefore the audio, on all of those cameras, you could nail the position of the shots probably within 20 feet and almost certainly better than 50 feet. Imagine if it was today and you had 100 people or 200 people with cell phones all recording video scattered throughout the plaza. You wouldn't be talking, you know, isolating the sound locations to 20, 30 feet. You'd be talking a few feet, maybe even inches, and being able to conclusively rule out or confirm basically any of the theories that have been going around. The other thing to consider, and of course there's nothing we can do about it now, but imagine if the cameras we had then were comparable to the cameras we have today. You know, a digital SLR with 30, 40, 50 megapixel and dynamic range orders of magnitude better than what film of the day had. Imagine the pictures of the spectators and being able to vastly more accurately confirm the identity of people in the crowd. Imagine the images taken of the grassy knoll, for example, the badge man, and being able to pull up the shadow detail, as you can with modern digital cameras, in a way that almost certainly would confirm or refute any of those theories relating to the presence of people, visible presence of people, on the grassy knoll. Alas, <laughs> not to be. So that's about it. Um, proceed to view the other three videos as you wish. Um, again, I, I, I don't anticipate there being anything of any great unknown value in them and present them only because I can. And on the odd chance that there's perhaps something of value in there that may have been overlooked by somebody else. In any case, um, view them as you wish and um, see what happens.